Welcome to Blessed Man Meditations. My name is Andy. On this YouTube channel, I offer thoughtful responses to skeptical objections to the Christian faith. I likewise edify the saints by equipping them to provide an answer for the hope that lies within them. I hope that you find value in my work. Please like my videos, send me comments, and please subscribe. Let's work together to contend earnestly for the faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. Thank you for tuning in to Blessed Man Meditations, where we provide answers to the intellectual side of Christian belief and equip Christians to provide a defense for the hope that is in them. Today we continue our look at Is Atheism Dead? by Eric Metaxas. Metaxas is a best-selling author whose books have been translated into 25 languages. He is the host of a nationally syndicated radio show and the acclaimed conversation series Socrates in the City. Metaxas is a prominent cultural commentator whose work has appeared in the likes of the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, and the Wall Street Journal. Some years ago, he published an article on the Wall Street Journal about how science increasingly makes a case for the existence of atheistic God, the God of the Bible specifically. And this book, Is Atheism Dead?, is an expansion of thesis in that article. Today we continue our look at part two of Is Atheism Dead by Eric Metaxas. And the title of part two of this book, which encompasses multiple chapters, is The Stones Will Cry Out. The ninth chapter of the book, Is Atheism Dead?, is The Evidence of Archaeology. Metaxas begins his chapter with a quote from Rabbi Dr. Nelson Gluick. The quote says, may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference, end quote by archaeologist Gluick. The man who delivered the statement on the previous slide was among the most respected of his century. He was close to many Israeli statesmen, including David Ben-Gurion, pictured below, Golda Meir, and Abba Iban, and for about 24 years he was president of Hebrew Union College. In 1961, Rabbi Gluick delivered the benediction at President JFK's inauguration in 1963. He was featured on the cover of Time magazine. But Rabbi Gluick was most famous for his pioneering work in the field of biblical archaeology. When one considers that he was more on the theologically liberal end of the spectrum, his statement is even more remarkable. It continued, quote, Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible, end quote, by Gluek. When someone like Gluek says something as strong as that, that it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery ever has pointed away from the Bible's veracity, it's hard not to take notice of such a statement. It's also hard not to wonder whether the book that some think of is a cobbled together compendium of ancient folktales, most of which are half-remembered and get many details wrong, even if there's some fundamental truth to them, is in fact the inerrant word of God. Metaxas is saying it's hard not to wonder whether the Bible is in fact the inerrant word of God, particularly when you have the scientific uh, discoveries that we previously discussed in going through this book, considering when you discover the archaeological discoveries that this book will discuss that corroborate the story uh, over and over again. Uh, it's hard not to ponder how not a single archaeological discovery has refuted what the scriptures have had to say. How else can we understand Gluck's fascinating assertion that all the archaeological discoveries confirm what the ancient scriptures say. First of all, is that contention true, that no archaeological discovery refutes what the Bible teaches? If, if that statement is true, is it still tr if it was true back then when it was originally made, is it still true today? We should be clear that biblical archaeology is a relatively new field that only began in the last half of the 19th century. Yet within a few decades, the number of finds confirming biblical accounts was overwhelming and flew in the face of the biblical skepticism that was popular at that time. By the early 20th century, so many finds continued to bear out the biblical account that the Bibles confirmed that every turn of the spade became a popular catchphrase. Every time archaeologists went digging, 
they seem to discover something else that corroborated biblical narratives. And this trend continued, as illustrated by Gluek's statement from the middle of the century. The track record of biblical archaeology baffled and continues to baffle those convinced that archaeology must eventually contradict the biblical accounts because it never has been shown to do that. One of these is James Agresti. Agresti is an aerospace engineer who, in his book Rational Conclusions, describes being a 25-year-old atheist determined to study the Bible to document the Bible's errors, much like what Josh McDowell did. And uh, as he went to disprove these things, he discovered that they were true. And the rest is history about McDowell. What he encountered surprised him. What Agresti encountered surprised him. And by the time Agresti was finished, he was instead persuaded of the truth of Scripture rather than persuaded against it. But one of the main reasons for his about face was what he learned about the archaeological record. Agresti echoed Rabbi Gluick, and Agresti concluded, quote, I've yet to encounter archaeological evidence that shows any part of the Bible to be inaccurate, quote. Eric Metaxas, the author of Is Atheism Dead, has the reverse story. Metaxas found faith before he ever considered whether the Bible could be corroborated via archaeology. Metaxas did not have much hope that the Bible could be corroborated with archaeology. He had become accustomed to the cultural narrative that tugged con consistently toward a secular and skeptical assessment of such things, and Metaxas assumed some things were simply too distant to have much hope of retrieving them via archaeology. He didn't think that archaeology would be helpful in corroborating scripture. Metaxas also assumed the staunch hostility in academic circles toward the Bible's historicity would quash any encouraging chirps along such lines. But on Washington's birthday in the year 1990, over 30 years ago now, Metaxas was reading the New York Times when, to his great surprise, he read a headline on page 8. The headline read, Believers Score in the Battle of Jericho. Here's what that article looks like on the New York Times website. The article's John Noble Wilford. You can still pull up that article today as I'm doing here. Um, Dr. Bryant Wood here says, when we compare the archaeological evidence of Jericho with the biblical narrative, we find a quite remarkable agreement. So archaeology is agreeing with the scripture. This article goes to great length to prove Metaxas's thesis. The article said recent discoveries of Jericho had upended previous conclusions about the biblical account. The dating of recently discovered pottery showed that the fabled walls of Jericho had indeed fallen at the time of Joshua, just as the scripture had said about 40 years after the purported exodus of the Jews from Egypt said they'd fallen inward too, so that the Israelites could climb up and over them to take the city, as the Bible had said they had. The archaeologist named Kathleen Kenyon in the 1950s said the opposite, but these new finds contradicted Kenyon's data and her conclusions. John Noble Wilford, who, uh, who authored the article on the New York Times, uh, was as respected a journalist as existed. He had two Pulitzers, along with the insuperable accomplishment of having written the Times Epochal Men Land on the Moon story in July 21st of 1969. So Metaxas was amazed to read in, in notably secular New York Times a straightforward report confirming the biblical account of something that happened shortly after Moses' death. Three years later, it happened again. Another Times article, this one on the front page, said Israeli archaeologists had discovered uh, the King David stele, bearing uh, the first reference outside the Bible to King David in the dynasty that he founded. The House of David. The article was again by the same John Noble Wilford, obviously the one who received such assignments. But the discovery of the archaeological evidence for the Bible's King David was genuinely earth shaking news, since many scholars thought David was a mere mythical figure like King Arthur. But here was evidence in stone that David, the giant killing shepherd boy who became king, was real, and that his dynasty was also real. His dynasty was in the 10th century BC. And it, his dynasty was every bit as historical as, the, as that of King Tut in the 14th century BC or Henry VIII in the 16th century AD. It was a truly stunning discovery. And as Metaxas remembers the article about biblical Jericho from a few years earlier, Metaxas began wondering what else. How much of what many of us had presumed was mythical or lost forever was not only historical but might still be revealed? So the question became is archaeology leading us to God? 
in the decade since. Metaxas has read of many more such things and has become to as and has come to wonder. Metaxas has come to wonder whether the spades and pickaxes of archaeologists have been doing what the telescopes and microscopes of scientists have been doing. It seems that slowly but surely they've been pointing unavoidably to the paradigm shifting idea that the Bible uh, and the God of the Bible real, that the God of the Bible is real, and that the stories that describe him can be corroborated. And as was the case with science, and as and as was with the case from science, the archaeological trend seems not only to continue, but over time to strengthen. So science kept discovering things that uh, showed that we live in a theistic universe, and that um, the laws that God set up continue to run because God sustains them. Archaeology. And archaeological discoveries uh, continue to corroborate the scriptural narrative. Some of the most astounding discoveries have been made extremely recently, and as we shall see in subsequent chapters, uh, Metaxas points out several of them, including not and including some so astounding that they are challenged to believe until one examines the evidence in context. At which point, one wonders less about whether these things are real than about how it's possible discoveries this extraordinary could have been kept quiet uh, that most people were unaware of them. Some of the most stupefying in recent years include the identification a decade ago of the biblical city of Sodom, complete with the evidence of the details of its incomparably dramatic destruction. And much more recently, the confirmation of several discoveries more bewildering still, such as Jesus' childhood home in Nazareth and the very pavement upon which Jesus, wearing his crown of thorns, stood at his trial before Pilate during what is surely one of the most famous scenes in world history. Below there are pictures of... Uh, the archaeological discovery of the discovery of Sodom. Uh, also pictures of what has become identified as Jesus' childhood home in Nazareth and what has become identified as the pavement on, where, on which Jesus stood when he was tried before Pontius Pilate. The silent stones of that pavement and many other stones, too, bear witness of what must have been taken on faith a few years or decades before. Now they don't have to be taken on mere faith. Uh, you have the archaeological evidence to demonstrate the uh, the geography uh, and the the historical setting that much of, of 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 several things that scripture describes the biblical skeptics the whole thing must the whole thing must seem like some irritating conspiracy so let's look at the beginning of biblical archaeology what we now call archaeology began in the 19th century, but did not become a serious discipline until the latter part of the 19th century. To understand why it emerged, we must look, we must look back to the Renaissance, which, among other things, signaled a nostalgia for classical antiquity. People began to look backward, beyond the Gothic landscape of the Middle Ages, to the Roman and Hellenistic and Hellenic uh, civilizations before them. A renewed interest in the distant past had bloomed. There always had been travelers who wrote of their adventures and who reported on strange sites. But now, as the English and other colonialist empires expanded into distant places where the civilizations of antiquity had existed, the desires to bring home treasures from these distant lands grew. Two early and famous examples of this were the 1799 discovery of the Rosetta Stone and the 1801, and in 1801, the grotesque removal from the Parthenon, the so-called Elgin Marbles. There's pictures of those below. Suddenly, the past was returning, and interest in finding more of it grew apace. Something that helped kick off the field of biblical archaeology was the visit to Palestine in 1838 of an American biblical scholar named Edward, Dr. Edward Robinson. He's pictured below. He actually made two trips, traveling exhaustively and identifying new rumble biblical sites, using his exhaustive knowledge of the Bible and of history and of many other writers and of many writers from antiquity. Robinson succeeded in separating much legendary fiction from fact. For example, Robinson agreed that the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron where Abraham and Sarah were said to be buried, was indeed authentic, while other places, such as Samson's well, where the famous strong man was supposed to have quenched his thirst after slaying a thousand Philistines, were not authentic. Robinson's most significant accomplishment during this time was his confirmation that the gigantic arch uh, named after him, the Robinson's Arch, that was once attached to what had been a monumental staircase leading up to the Temple Mount was not a more recent Roman or Muslim construction, but was in fact from the first century BC. There's a picture of Robinson's arch there. 
This meant the colossally large walls to which it was attached were from the time of the Second Temple to the 6th century BC. Suddenly, there was a tangible, visible link to the great history of the Jews as well as to the New Testament. These gigantic walls of the arch were something Jesus himself knew. He had almost certainly climbed the stairs the arch had supported. Josephus in the first century wrote of the arch, which was an architectural wonder of its day. But it was not until Robinson's visit in 1838 that Josephus' description could be identified as the arch still visible to all who visited Jerusalem. Suddenly, the world from two millennia past reached into the present where one could literally touch it. Three years later, Robinson published his landmark book on his findings, a book entitled Biblical Researches in Palestine, spurring greater interest in the field and leading to a spate of finds in the decades ahead, each of which surprised the world by confirming the historicity of the Old and New Testaments. Later, Robinson was an, was an archaeological pioneer, uh, bringing the world of the Old and New Testaments alive, discovering uh, places that the Bible identified. But the discovery we will discuss first is of no single artifact, but rather of a forgotten people and of a vast empire as powerful and long-lived as any that ever existed in human history. And if not for the words about them in the Hebrew scriptures, they almost certainly would be forgotten still. Those people were the Hittites. The story of the discovery of the Hittites is a classic example of how the historicity of the Bible was not taken seriously when the 19th century began, but was taken very seriously by the time the 19th century ended. As early 19th century biblical scholars began to make their case against the historical accuracy of the Bible, the non-existence of the Hittites came to be Exhibit A. There was at least some evidence for nearly every other major people and every other empire from the Babylonians to the Persians. The writers of antiquity had accounted for them all and many other peoples too, but why were there no extra why was there no extra biblical evidence for the Hittites, who were mentioned in the Bible 46 times? And why did none of the ancient writers, such as Thucydides or Strabo or Herodotus or Pliny, ever mention them? Historical evidence painted them as demographic phantoms, no less unaccounted for than the Nephilim. What sense did it make that these Hittites should exist only in the pages of an ancient document filled with invented stories of angels and demons? It's interesting that Hittites appear throughout the Bible, but speaking of far-flung existence in time and geographical space, too. First mention of the Hittites comes in the 23rd chapter of the book of Genesis when Abraham purchased what's known as the Cave of the Patriarchs from a Hittite named Ephron. There, in the old city of Hebron, on what is today Israel's West Bank, Abraham buried his wife Sarah and years later joined her. Apart from the Temple Mount, is the most, it is the most sacred site in Judaism, the Cave of the Patriarchs. Apart from the Temple Mount, is the most sacred site in Judaism. The Bible also says the grandson of Abraham and Sarah, Esau, married two pagan Hittite women, despite the strong disapproval of his parents, Isaac and Rebekah. A few centuries later, in the pages of, the Deut of Deuteronomy, Moses includes them in the list of those occupying the land of Canaan, when he says the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. In the account of the Syrian siege of Samaria in 2 Kings, we read that they suddenly retreated when they heard the noise of a great army. Look, the Syrians declared, the king of Israel is hired against us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians, to attack us. We encounter the most famous Hittite in the story of King David's adultery with Bathsheba, who was then married to one of his officers, known only then as Uriah, the Hittite. David's son Solomon himself had a number of Hittite wives. The Bible portrayed the Hittites as a vast empire with tremendous power stretching through the centuries. But where had they gone to? I mean, if we can't find them, then, then surely we can we can ride the hypothesis that they were not real, that they were just uh, one of the many things about the scripture that's made up. So if, if we can't find them, we can we can uh, be content to to ride that belief that they're just made up. So the fact that they are nowhere to be found uh, helps us to remain in our skepticism about the truthfulness of the Bible. But if we find them, then that changes things. If we find evidence of their existence, that changes things. Why was there no trace of the Hittites anywhere, even in ancient literature? Their non-existence was so complete in 1861 that Encyclopedia Britannica devoted a scant eight and a half lines to them, and this was only a polite summary of what the Bible said about them. For the extraordinary story of their rediscovery and resurrection into history, a 
strong corroboration of the biblical account, we must retreat to the first years of the century where we meet a decidedly eccentric Swiss explorer and orientalist named Johann Ludwig Burkhardt. There's a portrait of him below. Burkhardt was born in Luce at Lausanne and studied at Göttingen and Leipzig, afterward traveling to England to work for a British club called the Association for Promoting the Discovery of the Interior Parts of Africa, which is the organization that began the era of British exploration into the interior of the Dark Continent. To prepare himself for what could be a dangerous trip to Cairo and then to Niger in West Africa, Burkhardt decided in the year 1807 to study Arabic and medicine at Cambridge. Already by this time, Burkhardt had enthusiastically adopted the Arabian costume, cutting a colorful figure on canvas. When in eight when in 1809 Burkhardt traveled to Syria, he'd so perfected his disguise that he took the name Sheikh Ibrahim. Ibn Abdallah, and successfully passed himself off as a Mohammedan, although he wrote all his letters in French and signed them Luis. In 1812, Burkhart made a detour through Jordan to look for the lost German explorer Ulrich Jaspen, or Jasper Seetzen, who had been traveling in that area looking for the fabled lost city of Petra. Outdoing even Burkhart in, his, in this in his immersion and assimilation into Arab culture, Seetzen had by then converted to Islam and styled himself Hag Moses. Seetzen uh, went so far as to assume the disguise of a beggar, but fell afoul of some low characters and was subsequently murdered. While on Seetzen's trail, Burkhardt himself happened to discover the extraordinary ancient Nabataean city of Petra, for which he is now most famous. So there's Burkhardt discovering Petra, and there's Petra. Uh, those who remember the old uh, Indiana Jones movie, uh, the third one, The Last Crusade, they remember. Uh, that they remember Peter from that movie. But Burkhart, this this person on the left here, is the one who actually discovered it. But it was before this, while traveling through northern Syria, that Burkhart found himself passing through the city of Hamath, where he spotted some black basalt stones of great antiquity in the foundation of a building. On them was an inscription in a strange-looking language. Burkhart didn't mention what he saw before he died in 1817 but he kept a detailed journal that was published in 1822 as Travels in Syria and the Holy Land. It was, it was that the world first, it was in that that the world first read of the strange inscriptions. In the corner of a house in the bazaar is a stone with a number of small figures and signs, which appears to be a kind of hieroglyphic writing, though it does not resemble that of Egypt. Looking at these hieroglyphs today, we might we might well think of Keith Haring pictographs so we can only imagine how confusing it must have looked to Burkhart two centuries ago. It resembled nothing anyone in Europe had ever seen. Like the strange cuneiform writing first seen around that time, it was perfectly opaque. Nor would anyone see these stones again for 50 years, so the, or not that anyone would see these stones again for 50 years, so the mystery deepened. Meanwhile, something else was happening. In 1834, the French explorer Charles Tessier was wandering northward through Turkey, looking for the ruins of, the, of a lost Roman city called Abium. When Tessier and his men came to the village of Bakhaz Khoi, he inquired of the locals, Tessier did, whether they knew of any ancient ruins, whereupon they, they led him to some hill overlooking the village. There, Tessier was astounded to behold the remnants of a civilization that did not look Roman at all, but seemed very much older. There were several colossal fortification walls in the Cyclopean style, at that time being discovered in Greece. The size of the stones was extraordinary. Who would put them there? There's a picture of Tessier. The locals led Tessier further where he saw another monumental wall. It too seemed built by giants. It was extremely long. Tessier walked along it for what seemed like uh, a mile. Then he found still more wall stretching beyond what he could see. What thousands of workers have built. What thousands of workers have built this monstrous barrier? And when did they build it? Tessier eventually came to a monumental gate on which he saw the larger-than-life bas-relief of a helmeted figure holding an axe. About a mile on, he found a similar gate flanked with huge stone lions. Looks like that gate with the huge stone lions is the, is the top right corner of the top one. His guide led him further still until he stood yet before another site where he took in another bas relief that depicted a haunting procession of godlike figures bearing some resemblance to the one he'd seen before holding the axe. I wonder if that's those on the bottom. 
all of them wore peaked hats and were unlike anything he'd ever seen. Then he saw a kind of writing that was something like hieroglyphic pictographs, though he knew it was not Egyptian. Eshke walked the entire perimeter of the Great Wall, which he reckoned to be about three miles. What city had it once contained? It would have been even larger than ancient Athens. The city seemed once upon a time to have been tremendously significant, almost certainly the seat of a great empire. But now it was utterly lost to history. What happened? How could a civilization so obviously magnificent and powerful have died so completely that even those living in its shadow hadn't the dimmest idea what it was? It's almost impossible not to think of Percy Blythe Shelley's 1818 poem, Ozymandias, which speaks of the profoundly humbling idea that a world breathtaking of breathtaking grandeur and majesty, along with those once attached to its unparalleled power, might be forever forgotten, marked only by some inscrutable carvings. Let's look at Ozymandias. Here's Ozymandias. It says, I met a traveler from an, ancient, from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lays. His frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command held at its sculptor. Well, those passions read, which yet survived, stamped on those lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, he mighty in despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone level sands stretch far away. That's Ozymandias. Eshie knew someone had once lived and ruled here, but who? In any case, he did not publish his account and illustrations until 1862, nearly three decades later. But one year after Tessier's discovery, the British diplomat and antiquarian William Ham Hamilton stepped into the story. Hamilton had entered the lapidary annals of archaeology three decades before. It was Hamilton who personally recovered the fabled Rosetta Stone from a French ship on the verge of spiriting the fabled object away in contravention of the treaty signed after the nations defeated Alexandria. There's Hamilton and there's the Rosetta Stone below. Uh, astonishingly, Hamilton was also personally involved in the second aforementioned story, regrettably overseeing the unconscionable removal from the Acropolis of the infamously named Elgin Marbles, an act of cultural bar barbarism without equal, even in those culturally, bar culturally barbarous times, violently wrestling from them, their intended site atop the Parthenon's pediment and taking them to the British Museum too, where they and the Rosetta Stone could be seen today. But in 1835, Hamilton was traveling through Turkey when he visited the same site Tashiye had stumbled upon, 12 miles north in a place the Turks called Alachoyuk. Hamilton came upon a second ancient site. This one, with a great Sphinx figure, carved upon a buried city gate. He didn't publish his account until 1842, and as we've said, Tashiye's account didn't appear until 1862. And Tashiye's account finally was published 20 years. Uh, after Hamilton's, French archaeologist George Perrault took note and traveled to Turkey to investigate the spots that Tessier and Hamilton had seen or written about. But Perrault found something astonishing that both Tessier and Hamilton somehow missed. It was a tremendously long inscription stretching 25 feet across, carved onto a rock face. The local Turks called it Nishan Tash, but even to them it was as inscrutable as birdsong. Eight years after this, in 1870, our story returns to the city of Hamath in northern Syria, where Burkhardt in 1812 had seen strange hieroglyphics on the basalt foundation stones of some houses. Now it was two Americans who saw them. One was the Honorable J. Augustus Johnson, Jeremiah Augustus Johnson, pictured below, then consulting general in Beirut, and the other, his friend, the Reverend Samuel Jessup, an American missionary in Syria. They found themselves passing through Hamath, and Lake Burkhardt noticed the stones with their curious symbols. Their eyes fell upon three stones further nearby, all similarly inscribed in those exotic hieroglyphs. They knew what they were seeing was of great antiquity unknown to the wider world. So Johnson and Jessup decided they must use a technology that had been unknown when Burkhardt had seen had been there six days, six decades before. They would make paper mache impressions of what they saw, wanting a record to share these mysteries upon their return home. But while endeavoring to make these paper mache uh, 
impressions, they discovered that the locals had an outsized attachment to these stones and did not trust these strangers to bother them. It later came out that they believed the stones possessed magical healing properties, or at least they could make good money from those who believed this. But Johnson and Jessup meant no harm. They only wanted to make what were then called squeezes of the inscriptions, so they could uh, analyze what they, what they said. These were all the rage in the 19th century, these squeezes, and involved applying a thoroughly soaked sheet of chemicals or chemist's filter paper to the intended inscription, beating it with a brush to squeeze out any air bubbles and then allowing it to air dry. When peeled away, it gave a very accurate, albeit backwards, facsimile of the inscription. They're just wanting to make a copy of what it said, but the locals were not persuaded that this was harmless. Uh, screaming and interfering with Johnson and Jessup. Fanatical Muslims crowded upon us when we began to work upon the stones, Johnson wrote, so the copies they managed to get were far from ideal. Despite the uh, less than ideal copies, uh, he published his findings, however imperfect they were, in the first quarterly statement of the American Palestine Exploration Society, which attracted renewed attention to the growing hieroglyphic puzzle. Shortly thereafter, 100 miles north in Aleppo, another stone was found with characters in what appeared to be the same lost land. When Johnson returned to Beirut, he showed the published images to Professor E.H. Palmer, a British explorer. explorer. There's Professor Palmer. Palmer was making a survey of the Sinai and was intrigued by the inscriptions, as well as by Johnson's story of being unable to get accurate squeezes. So, despite this difficulty, Palmer had an idea. Palmer had been accompanied in many of his travels by a younger partner named Charles Byrett Drake, who possessed a remarkable facility for gaining the trust of the locals. In their travels, Drake and Palmer desperately hoped to discover another Moabite stone, which we will discuss shortly. So Palmer persuaded the committee of the Palestine Exploration Fund to send Drake to Hammoth, thinking he might wheedle the obstinate locals into permitting him accurate squeezes of previous inscriptions made the trip in June 1871, and although not entirely successful, Drake made passable squeezes of the most important inscriptions. Even better, Drake brought another technology to bear upon the situation and took some excellent photographs. Drake and Palmer traveled extensively with the, with the colorful and fabled explorer Richard Burton, then British consul in Damascus, and Burton co-authored his two-volume Unexplored Syria with Drake in 1872. In this, they included copies of the Hamath inscriptions, provoking still further interest. But Burton had followed the disastrous horror surrounding the discovery of the Moabite stone and knew that a firm hand must be brought to bear lest everything be lost. They didn't want to lose the inscriptions because they wanted to figure out what they were. He sternly suggested an attempt be made to purchase at least two of the stones outright by means of the Iraq order intended to be obeyed. In 1873, Burton published an article in the Journal of Royal Anthropological in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, telling of his own subsequent visit to the town, and in detail described the stones and their locations, and even speculated on the hieroglyph hieroglyphic puzzle. Burton was a linguistic savant who spoke twenty six languages, including many dialects. In this article, he quoted Johnson and Jessup, who believed that the inscriptions were likely a transitional form, a syllabic language, between hieroglyphic pictographs and alphabetic letters. By this time, however, the strange language had been seen on, seen in, uh, had been seen in, or uh, other inscriptions in a number of the farthest fun locations, some as far west as Smyrna, uh, Smyrna in Asia Minor, today which is today Izmir and Turkey, and some as far southeast as Aleppo. How could any strange language or culture extend 800 miles across at a time when 800 miles was roughly the compass of the known world, and yet somehow be altogether vanished, though absentmindedly mislaid by history herself? At this point, an Irish missionary named William Wright enters the story. He'd been persuaded by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Victorian Prince of Preachers, spent his life on the mission field, and eventually settled in Damascus, Syria, where he began taking a serious interest in the mystery of, those mis of these much-discussed finds. After studying the evidence for some time, Wright arrived at a novel conclusion. This is because there was one ancient document in which Wright was an expert, in which 
had been ignored by those involved in this mystery. Wright believed the document he knew so well held the answer to this confounding puzzle. It was the Hittites, Wright said. Wright saw what the Bible said about the people called the Hitt uh, about the people called the Hittites, how that matched the evidence of these far-flung hieroglyphic inscriptions in magnificent ruins. And Wright said that these inscriptions in these ruins came from the Hittites. But who could know if Wright was correct? Another figure now entered the picture too. His name was Archibald Henry Sace, pictured below. Like Burton, Sace was a linguistic savant, reading Latin and ancient Greek before he was aged 10, and eventually reading and writing 20 modern and ancient languages. Although famous as a pioneer in deciphering Assyrian cuneiform, Sace around this time had taken a particular interest in the Indo-European tongues, which ultimately evolved into all languages of Europe. As he puzzled over the curious inscription, Sace came to, the to a conclusion similar to Wright's. Sace also concluded that they were evidence of the long-lost empire of the Hittites. Even so, it must wait until 1880 at a London meeting of the Society for Biblical Archaeology, for Sace boldly to lay his cards on the table. In that now, in that now famous 1880 meeting, Sace declared the shocking news. The unknown language written all the way from the Turkish Mediterranean to the Syrian desert was not related to uh, Assyrian or to Egyptian, both of, both of which had come known to linguists by this time, but was instead a completely unrelated hieroglyphic language in the Indonesian European family and was a syllabic language. Face had by then done enough work to puzzle out some of what the otherwise opaque symbol said and announced that the people of Hattusa whom some of the inscriptions he had translated referred, were none other than the Hittites mentioned in the Bible. So these inscriptions, Sace says, refer to the Hittites mentioned in the Bible. So we've got uh, this archaeological find corroborating the existence of the Hittites, something that the, uh, that the Bible records. It was a startling claim, and as always happens in such cases, as we've seen, Wright and Sace were both roundly attacked by scholars, not because their claim not least because their claim leaned so heavily on what the Bible had to say. And of course, we see this today. Uh, anytime a conservative or a Bible believer comes out with a finding or evidence uh, of some sort that seeks to support the scriptural record, uh, the skeptic majority is quick to attack them, is quick to malign them, um, because they don't want to be awakened from their skeptical slumber. They don't want to be awakened, awakened from their moral lack of responsibility. They want to continue to do what they've always done and not have anybody tell them that what they're doing is wrong. They want to live as though there is no judgment after death. So if the Bible is going to be shown to be true, then that means that there is an ultimate Lord that, that everyone's going to have to bow to in this life or the next. And they don't want to hear that because that is going to force a moral uh, inventory that all of us are going to fail because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Wright and Sace stuck to their guns, and in time, more pieces of evidence for their thesis emerged and continue to emerge. But it is only thanks to that ancient document known as the Bible that history ever had the honor of discovering the Hittites. In 1887, for example, 1,200 miles away in Egypt, several clay tablets with the Syrian cuneiform writing were found addressed to Pharaoh Akhenaten, the father of Tutankhamun. By this time, thanks in part to Sace, a Syrian cuneiform had largely been deciphered. One of these letters was from a king named Sapulianus. In two of these letters had next to the Assyrian cuneiform another language which was thought to be the same as the mysterious inscriptions. Three years later, in the year 1890 at Bakazkale, a startlingly impressive board of tablets was discovered near the ruins 
Burkhardt had stumbled upon in 1812. This trove of tablets contained what proved to be 10,000 tablets covered in cuneiform. Some of it was Akkadian cuneiform, the diplomatic lingua franca of that day, and some of it was in a hither un, hitherto unknown cuneiform. As yet unknown, it would be another 16 years before these tablets would meet the man who could decipher them and solve the puzzle once and forever. Hugo Winkler was a famously irascible German philologist, Hugo Winkler's pictured below. The archaeologist David Down described Winkler as having an unfortunate personality, as someone who made an instant enemy of anyone he met. But Winkler also could read the Assyrian cuneiform like the morning newspaper. It was this unpleasant genius who eventually deciphered the second cuneiform language only tablets, identifying it as what we now call Luwian, the language of the ancient Hittites. So Winkler identified the language of the ancient Hittites. This effectively marked the end of the question whether the Hittites existed and who they were. I mean, it would sure be an awfully elaborate conspiracy to invent a language, go to all that hard work of inscribing it on those tablets, and burying it underground, only to have somebody unbury it and discover it. And but make it in some language that can actually be translated into something that other people could understand. It just doesn't make sense that that would be, that that collaborative a scheme would be made up. This is actual history we're talking about here instead. The Bible was not only soundly and decisively vindicated, but as we had said, it was the Hebrew scriptures alone that guided Sace and Wright in untangling the conundrum. Details about the extent of the Hittite centuries-long empire, empire now place their beginnings in the 12th century BC and track their seven centuries-long rise to tremendous prominence and power under Supiliamus, built the great capital of Hattusa, which is the walled city whose ruins Burkhardt found in 1812. At its height, it boasted a population of 50,000, and we now know that the monumental inscription called Nishan Tash, pictured below, is a list of Hittite kings the last of whom was Supuliamus himself, who had the inscription made and who led the Hittites in the 14th century BC. The vast empire, excuse me, the vast hope of their, treaty, of their treaties and trade touched virtually every empire and people for the better part of the entire second millennium BC, including the Egyptians, Mycenaean Greeks, Assyrians, Babylonians, and even the tribe of Judah, which is, of course, how he came to be introduced to them in the first place when they crossed paths with the tribe of Judah. We also know now that King Tut's mother, King Tutankhamun's mother, after the death of her young son and then the death of her husband Akhenaten, wrote to King Sipiliamus at Hattusa, asking that he send one of his own sons, who she herself could marry, in order to keep her dynasty alive. It would have been his as as historic union between it would have been a historic union between the between Egypt and the Hittites, the two great empires of that day. But before this could happen, Sipiliamus's enemies murdered his son en route before that could happen. Nonetheless, we know now that the Hittite Empire rivaled the other superpowers of that time, the Syrians and the Egyptians, and that its influence in language continued far beyond the decline of the empire in the 12th century BC. It was not until 1953 that the strange pictograph scripts in the foundations of the houses in Hamath were discovered and, and were deciphered and discovered to be the same Luwiab Hittite language as the cuneiform inscriptions discovered by deciphered by Hugo Winkler, albeit in a, syllab, in a syllabic hieroglyphic form. Just the previous year, in 1952, the linguist Michael Ventrist had broken the linear B code discovered on a trove of baked clay tablets at Nassos in Crete by Sir Arthur Evans in 1900, showing it to be an earlier syllabic Iron Age Mycenaean form of Greek later expressed in the Greek alphabet. So the Hittite language, too, had been expressed in both syllabic hieroglyphic form and in cuneiform. Both the Greek and the Luwian first been expressed in the syllabic hieroglyphic form. Linear B Greek, linear B syllabic Greek language of the Minoans and Mycenaeans preceded the Greek alphabetic language, 
but it seems that the Lulian syllabic hieroglyphics, which have been found as early as 2000 BC, were replaced by the cuneiform version for a time. But this Lulian cuneiform disappeared after the 12th century collapse of the Hittite Empire and was replaced by the older syllabic hieroglyphic form of the language first seen on the stones and the foundations of the buildings at Hamath, which attest to the Hittite culture's influence centuries after the glory days of Hattusa and Sapulianus. All this is just going to explain how the Hittites, you have all the circumstantial evidence of tablets written in their language um, showing that they were a real people who really existed. Uh, and so we can infer from that that things that the Bible records about them, uh, when you take the other historical discoveries that are found to be consistent with what the Bible had said, uh, you can infer that what it says about the Hittites is also accurate. We also know that Sace was correct when he determined in 1880 that the Hittite language was a very early Indo-European tongue dating back, as we've said, to 2000 BC. So we know the Hittites existed and in such a heightened breadth as the greatest of any civilizations. The Bible alone held their name aloft through the darkness of three millennia until at long last the new fields of archaeology and philology could catch up with it. So they found these stone monuments that pointed to them, and then you had people who could translate their language. Uh, and these things corroborated uh, the biblical account. Those who clung to the Bible as a source of inerrant truth in all matters, whether geographical, historical, or other, had in the story of the Hittites been vindicated once more. The story of the discovery of the Hittites spans the greatest distance from the time before archaeology all the way into the mid 20th century, but now you go backward to the beginning of the story to 1846 when archaeology was not yet quite was not quite yet a field, but was just coming to be one. It was that year when Sir Austin Henry Laird unearthed something that for the first time would link the whole inside of the Bible to the world outside the Bible and begin the process that continues to this day in which the events and details of the Bible have been corroborated. That is the end of chapter 9 and of Is Atheism Dead by Eric Metaxas. Next time, uh, we will continue uh, investigating the archaeological discoveries. And next time will be chapter 10, where we look at the black obelisk that became a golden spike. So, thank you for tuning in. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And I hope you have a blessed rest of your day.